Oh, I'm sorry, this is in English because uh, I'm too stupid to learn Portuguese. It's, um, uh, are you all web developers? Show me your hand if you're a web developer. Okay, this is not too technical, but if, if it gets too technical for those of you who are not web developers, just put your hand up and ask me a question. I don't bite. Um, this talk's also relevant for managers of web developers and SEO people too. And it's called How to Make Loveliness because that is what HTML stands for. Uh, and the subtitle is the HTML treasure hunt because I'm going to show you some things in HTML which will really work well for you in your web development <clears throat> or which you should tell your web development team to look into to make everything better. So who am I, you're asking? Why is this handsome middle-aged guy talking to you in English uh, on a Saturday morning? Well, I'm one of the I'm one of the editors of the HTML5 spec at the W3C. Uh, that's the group who makes the languages that the web runs on. Uh, one of the things we have to do is make sure that the web works for everybody. So my interest is making sure that the web can work for people who use right-to-left languages like Arabic and Hebrew, uh, and the web works correctly for people Hello, you've missed the good bits. It's the boring bits now, sorry. And that the web works well for people who use vertical text, like Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And also that the web works well for people who have a disability. Um, that's not just people who uh, are blind, although it can be them. It can be people who are deaf. It can be people who have bad uh, motor control. Maybe they're elderly. Maybe they have Parkinson's disease or maybe they're situationally disabled. Maybe you are on a crowded bus and you cannot hear your phone. Maybe you are um, a nursing mother and you have a baby in your hand so you can only use the computer with one hand. Maybe it's you and you broke your arm. There's many reasons why people can have a disability. Uh, I also was part of the committee that wrote the British standard for web accessibility that's now just become an international standard. And I wrote, or well, co-wrote, the first book on HTML5 and this book on web accessibility. And also, I, I, in my free time, I play music and I'm a purple belt in kickboxing. So if you don't like the talk, we can fight. <coughs> um, yeah, but fundamentally, I am Bruce and I am an HTML alcoholic. Uh, HTML is the, the name of a brand of men's fashion in Tokyo, Japan. Um, so this is me lying on the floor of a Tokyo department store and the security guards getting pretty freaked out. Um, but HTML is full of treasures, but you have to dig for them. Once you find them, you will be rewarded with fabulous wealth and your boss will love you forever. You will make your sites more performant. They will work faster. They will be more accessible to people with disabilities and people who are not in Europe. They will be more robust. They will work better in bad network conditions on older computers, on older devices. I come in, join the party. Um, you will write less code because as a developer, you are not paid by the line of code. It is your job to write as little code as possible. And that means you have less code to test. And writing less code and testing less code means that you, as a web developer, go to the pub earlier, which is your human right as a developer. Or you can play Call of Duty or see your kids or do whatever it is you do. Because this, developer friends, is your right. So let us look at the treasure map. I'm not going to get naked for you, no matter how much you ask uh, or how much you pay. The, the treasure map. Use HTML properly, and I'm going to show you how. 
write more HTML, use CSS properly. Built in, beats, bolt on, bigly. What do I mean by this? I mean, if HTML gives you something for free, use it. Don't write it in JavaScript, because why would you write something in JavaScript if HTML gives it to you? Writing code is not your job. Writing less code and solving the problem most efficiently is your job. Now, I'm not afraid of frameworks. I was in Bucharest in Romania, and I saw this graffiti which said, React, run. But I'm not frightened of React. I'm not frightened of Ambi Ambular, Angular or Ember. Uh, I recently was working on an open source project that allowed you to use real CSS with React. It's called Stylable. It's BDSM licensed. You might want to check it out. Um, <clears throat> But I know that Angular, Ember, React, they are just tools. Yep, they are big, well-known tools, but they are just tools. So if you want to use React, Ember, Angular, Bonestrap, Hubpack.js in your next project, go for it. Knock yourself out. Enjoy it. Remember that in about 16 minutes, that will be old-fashioned and you have to learn something else. But whatever tools you use, make sure they produce good HTML, because that is the foundation of the web. Cough break. <coughs> Who likes furniture? Yeah, I love furniture. I'm stockpiling it in the UK so we can burn it for fuel after Brexit. <laughs> but uh, this is the technique of furniture making. Thank you for laughing. It makes me happy. Since its first publication in 1970, hi, this is the furniture talk. Take a seat. <laughs> Since its publication in 1970, the technique of furniture making has established itself for the, as the Bible for all woodworkers. Cheers, vodka. Um, and then in the introduction of this book, it says, any textbook concerned with the techniques of furniture making must deal primarily with the basic handicrafts, for it is upon this groundwork that the machine production is built. And in fact, all the machine can ever do is translate the essential hand operations into rotary movements of the cutting tool. In other words, even if you are using machines to make your furniture or machines to make your websites, like React, like jQuery, like Angular, you still need to know the basics. Anyone who has only been shown how to force a piece of wood against a mechanized saw will have learned very little. But if he or she has had to saw that piece of wood by hand, he or she will be more likely to know that much more about it. He or she will have greater respect for it and will understand in greater depth the problems that will have to be faced in its manipulation. In other words, know the raw materials of the wood that you're working on. And that's why in the first 200 pages of this Bible of woodworking, it doesn't talk about tools at all. You have average comparative movement of different humidities of different kinds of woods. You have diagrams of which cut of the wood is the strongest. You have illustrations of the different cut types of grain. Before it even talks about making furniture, the first 200 pages of this book is about the raw materials. There's a great book called Japanese Woodworking Tools by Tashio Odate, and he says, the Japanese word shakunin is defined by both Japanese and English Japanese dictionaries as craftsman or artisan, but that does not fully express the deeper meaning. Shakunin means not only having a technical skill, but also implies an attitude and social consciousness, a social obligation to work his best for the general welfare of people, an obligation both material and spiritual. And I'm going to suggest to you, hi, come in. This is the furniture workshop. I'm going to suggest to you that you need to be a shakunin of the web. Who knows this guy? Yeah, this is Sir Uncle Timbo. 
as I call him. I'm allowed to call him that because he asked me to sign a copy of my HTML5 book. Sadly, there are no photographs of this. When Sir Uncle Timbo invented the web and at the opening of the London 2012 Olympics, he said, this is for everyone, and it was. This is the first ever website <coughs> made by Sir Uncle Timbo. There's some seats at the front. Um, this is the first ever website that Sir Uncle Timbo made. And here it is running in the latest version of Chrome. You can see that it is fully responsive. As I narrow the window, the text adjusts. As I tab with the tab key, you can see that I'm going from link to link, and I have a nice focus indicator to show where I am. And if I hit the space bar or enter, I activate the link and I go there. The first ever website was fully responsive, fully accessible. But we broke it. We broke it in hundreds of terrible ways. We broke it by insisting upon fixed width websites. In the early 2000s, we thought everybody has a wide monitor. Every website can be 800 pixels wide. And then the iPhone came out, and we all thought, ah, shit. <laughs> we broke it by making websites with terrible contrast, light gray text upon a white background. I'm nearly 30, right? So my eyesight is pretty poor. I cannot read your text if it's thin gray text on a white background. Um, we broke it by insisting upon pixel perfect layout as if the web were print. Spoiler, it's not. We broke it by not having captions on videos. We broke it by breaking keyboard accessibility. Many people, including me, use the web using their keyboard. If any of you are developers, I will bet that you use keyboard shortcuts in your code editor all the time. If somebody turned those off, you'd be pissed off. So don't do it to people who are using your websites. We broke it by removing that focus indicator, that blue circle around the current link. If you are evil, you can just say star, outline non, and you can make sure that somebody using the keyboard has no idea where they are on a web page. But nobody here is evil, right? So I urge you to concentrate less upon the tools and look more at the raw materials of the web. And the raw materials are, of course, JavaScript, HTML, HTML5 now, and CSS, <coughs> CSS3. Um, and to symbolize these, Here's me representing HTML. I didn't write HTML. I only invented the picture element. Here's Brendan Eich, who invented JavaScript. And here's Halcom William Lee, who invented CSS. And look, we're having a beer together. Nobody's fighting. The reason nobody's fighting is because, number one, we're all middle-aged men. Number two, uh, we're too old for it. And number three, because actually these technologies are meant to be used together. None of them is the champ. None of them is the best. They're designed to be used all together. But people forget this, vodka. So here is an article that recently appeared on Medium. I photoshopped out the author's name because I don't want to name or shame him or her. This is not an individual being evil. This is a symptom of what is wrong in our industry now. 10 things to learn for becoming, oh, I can do this. 10, th oh, look at that. 10 things to learn for becoming a solid, full stack JavaScript developer. The top four. Number one, have a fundamental understanding of JavaScript. Well, yeah. You're not going to be a JavaScript developer if you don't understand JavaScript. You might be a jQuery developer. You might be a React monkey, but you're not a JavaScript developer. <clears throat> Number two, learn a front-end framework. Is that necessary to be a JavaScript developer? I suggest not. That's just a tool. 
Number three, learn Bootstrap 4. Because why? I don't know. And number four, kind of as an afterthought, HTML and CSS. Just kind of an afterthought there. The author says, as for HTML, there's not much to learn right away, and you can kind of learn as you go. Before you make your first templates, know the difference between inline elements like block and span, and know how they differ from ones like div. This will save you a huge amount of headache when fiddling with your CSS code. This is what's wrong in our industry. The idea that CSS is fiddling. HTML has not much to learn as you go. This is, and I'm going to use a computer science term, bullshit. Okay? This is wrong because these are the foundational technologies of the web. So let's look at the wood. Let's look at the raw materials. HTML is declarative. You say, give me a button, and a button appears. It's kind of be like being God. You just say, let there be a button, and there it is. You don't care about how the browser makes it happen. It just happens. HTML is fault tolerant. This is in red, because you shouldn't do this. But Netscape invented the blink tag, which makes text blink. Internet Explorer never implemented the blink tag. But when Internet Explorer sees this, <coughs> what does it do? It just shows the content. That's all. When any browser sees an HTML element it doesn't know, it will always show the content. Which means that if you have a browser that doesn't understand the blink tag, you still see the content by design. Which means that HTML is, by design, backwards compatible. When we made the video element in HTML5, you see, inside the opening and closing tags, we have some content. I can't play this, download it, and then you can double click on it and see the video in your operating system's uh, built-in media player. If you do understand the video tag, you don't show the content, you just play the video. Guaranteed backwards compatible. This is a superpower of HTML. So when I invented the picture element for responsive images, which can shave up to 70% of your uh, page's download size, we use this backwards compatibility. If you are IE6, you don't understand this, you don't understand that, but you do understand this, so you show the image. If you are IE4, you do understand this, you show the image. It's backwards compatible. If you do understand the picture element, but you do not understand the WebP format, then you show the fallback content. Nobody gets a worse time. And if you are Chrome, Firefox, or Opera, and you do understand WebP, you will show the WebP, which is about 30% smaller than JPEG for the same picture quality. Nobody gets a worse time with HTML. And if you have a modern browser, you get a better time. Backwards compatible by default. So I showed you the first ever web page in a modern browser. This is the first ever browser. It's just called World Wide Web that Sir Uncle Timbo wrote. And here it is showing my HTML5 blog. OK, it's not pretty. It doesn't understand Unicode. But there's some styling built in. Everything works. Because HTML5 is backwards compatible to the first ever browser that was written 25 years ago. Your JavaScript isn't. Therefore, when you can use HTML, use it. HTML is interoperable. Here I'm opening a B. I'm opening an I. And I'm closing the B before the I. Now, before HTML5, in IE, Safari, and Firefox, the B and the I would be next to each other in the DOM, the document object model. In Chrome and Opera, 
the I would be underneath the B in the document object model. Nobody was wrong, because HTML4 only told you what to do with valid code. Now, nobody in this room, I'm looking at you and I can see, nobody in this room ever made an error in their code, right? <laughs> but you will work with some loser who does this, right? <laughs> the trouble was with this is if different browsers were showing different DOMs, it meant writing scripts that looked at the DOM was really, really brittle, really time-consuming, and you didn't get to go to the pub at 5 o'clock on a Friday night. But HTML5 has what's called the HTML5 parsing algorithm, which guarantees no matter what combination of bad markup you write, it will produce the same DOM in every browser. It might not be the DOM you want, but at least it will break the same on every browser. This is, this is, in my opinion, an HTML5 ninja. Super powerful, but nobody ever notices it. But it means that websites now have greater interoperability than ever before. JavaScript, on the other hand, is not declarative. It's imperative. You have to tell the browser step by step how to do something. And that's more code, and that's more brittle, and that's more time consuming. There's more to go wrong. Uh, if you're a fan of 1970s sexist uh, English cartoons, it's like this, not fault tolerant. Your JavaScript has an error, it just stops. Your HTML isn't understood by the browser, and the browser just shows the content and carries on. So Uncle Timbo wrote when he designed the web, about the principle of least power. The low power end of the scale is typically simpler to design, implement, and use. The high power end of the scale has all the attraction of being an open-ended hook into which anything can be placed. And the foundational principle of the web is use the technology with the least power. So if you can do it in HTML, do it in HTML. If you can do it in CSS, do it in CSS. If you can't do it in HTML and CSS, then go for JavaScript, of course. But don't do it in JavaScript if you can do it in HTML. Use the right tool for the right job. 13 million requests for JavaScript will time out. This is uh, from a conference talk by BuzzFeed. 1% of requests for JavaScript on BuzzFeed time out. That's about 13 million requests a month. <clears throat> I guarantee you that you have seen JavaScript not working on your super high-powered phones because you're in the metro and the JavaScript hasn't come down for some reason, or you're using a public Wi-Fi that blocks some scripts. Every one of us has times when JavaScript doesn't work. This is not just a problem for people in uh, Nepal or Bangladesh. Everyone has JavaScript right, says my friend Stuart Langridge on this page. No. Here's the whole flowchart of where you might not have JavaScript. But you always get the HTML and the CSS. OK, here's a, a sign saying there are bees ahead. This is a, a shitty joke about free bees. HTML, shh, HTML gives us free bees. We've all seen this. Check if you don't want to not opt out of canceling or stopping you, sending you spam forever. Because we've all seen this. These two look absolutely identical apart from a tiny amount of spacing there. The top one is not accessible. The bottom one is. Here's me trying to click inside the text in order to fill in that. I can't. I have to have super sniper markmanship to fill that in. This one. You click anywhere in the label, and it fills in that. Now, I have multiple sclerosis, which is a degenerative uh, spinal disease, so my fingers are not great using a mouse. 
but also you sitting on a bumpy bus or a bumpy train with a relatively small screen with your fat little developer finger are also <laughs> going to have trouble clicking that. So making it so that the whole label is the click area is good for everybody. And the code is stupidly simple. The first one, I have an input of checkbox, but the label, what looks like a label, is just a span. The second, I've actually got an HTML label element that wraps the input. And in every browser since IE3, clicking on the label will activate the checkbox. This isn't hard. This isn't extra code to write. This is just using the right HTML to take advantage of stuff that the browser gives you for free. So if you are a marksman and you can click that little box, you don't even notice this behavior. But if you're like me and you have multiple sclerosis or you have fat little developer fingers on a bumpy bus, this makes your life slightly easier. Why would you not do this? Answer, because you are evil. Because this is how the web works for somebody with a disability. Not only when you download the HTML does your browser construct a document object model, it also constructs, whoa, an accessibility tree. <laughs> and this is mapping things in your HTML to things the operating system knows about. Uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, etc. they all have the concept of checkboxes. They all have the concept of buttons. So if you use a button in your HTML, that gets mapped to an operating system button. And if you're using an assistive technology, for example, a screen reader, that will tell the user, here's a button or here's a label, and they can do what they want. But if you don't use an HTML semantic, if you just use a div, that doesn't get communicated to the accessibility tree. So it doesn't get communicated to the assistive technology. So it doesn't get communicated to the user. <clears throat> so here's a button in React. Div class equals button. Click me if you can. OK. You can style this to look like a button, but it isn't a button. It's a div. So in order to mimic browser behavior, you have to set an ARIA role in HTML or CSS. You'd have to say div role equals button. That's saying, I'm only a div, but I'm pretending to be a button. If you don't do that, you don't get that accessibility mapping. This is extra code for you, have, for you to write. You also have to remember to manage focusability, because a div can't be focused by somebody clicking the tab key. It can only be focused by somebody clicking on it with a mouse. Whereas a real button can be focused with a tab key. So you have to remember to manage focusability. More code for you to write. I'm not stopping now, Pedro. OK. I'm going to go on till tomorrow, regardless of what you say. And remember to listen for the correct key presses, because in every browser, a button can be activated by a space bar or the enter key. So listen for key press 13 and listen for key press 32. You have to do this if you choose to use a div, not a button. Or if you use a button, it will just work. You've all seen this. This was HTML4. Div ID equals nav, div ID equals header, div ID equals main or content or something. An article, this could be a YouTube video, it could be a book on Amazon, it could be uh, a newspaper story, it doesn't matter. And div ID equals footer. In HTML4, these, you didn't have a semantic to distinguish between these uh, elements of the page. In HTML5, we do. Because the div element has no special meaning at all. This is from the spec. Authors are strongly encouraged to view the div element as an element of last resort for when no other element is suitable. Use of more appropriate elements instead of the div element leads to better accessibility for readers, the people that you serve, and easier maintainability for authors, you. So it means you get to go to the pub earlier, which is your human right as a developer. 
So in HTML5, we invented these tags, header, nav, main, article, footer. If you write div, you're writing div three characters. If you write nav, you are writing three characters. This is no extra work for you. It's, if you don't need assistive technologies, this is invisible to you. But if you do need assistive technologies, this is great. In a survey of screen reader users last year, <clears throat> how often do you navigate by landmarks, header, footer, nav, in your screen reader? Whenever they are available, 25%. Often, 18%. Sometimes, 28%. Never, 13%. So using header, footer, nav, main, just those four elements, you are helping more than 65% of screen reader users at no cost to you and at no cost to people who do not need these. Um, recently, I asked my friend Leonie Watson to have a look at my personal website. Leonie is an old friend of mine. She was a web designer in her 20s and then she lost her eyesight. She's still a web developer and designer, but she's blind, so she uses a screen reader. And I asked her to talk me through exactly how header, nav, footer, main help her. So here we go. Since personal site Mozilla Firefox, Bruce Lawson's personal site, 27 regions, 21 headings, and 187 links. Bruce Lawson's personal site, visit at heading level one link, Bruce Lawson's Lawson's. So I'm going to stop that there. First thing you learn when you've got a screen reader is the key to stop it talking. There is only so much talking in your ear you can cope with during the course of the day. And in most screen readers, the control key is what will stop it talking. What you heard then was the screen reader do several things as the page loaded. It told me the title of the site, Bruce Lawson's personal site. That's the bit that's contained in the title element inside uh, the head elements on the page. These days, I understand in, in the visual appearance of browsers, that's not a very visible piece of information. Back in the day when I last saw a browser, uh, the title was very often displayed quite prominently at the top of the browser window. But for a screen reader user, it's still the first piece of information that you encounter on the page, and it's incredibly useful because it's often the first guarantee or first confirmation that you've got that you've ended up on the page that you intended to reach. You might also have heard that the screen reader then just gave a quick summary of some of the key elements on the page. It told me there were some regions on the page and some headings. So already that's given me a bit of a clue as to how I can start exploring this page. One thing you can't do as a blind screen reader user is take in the page at a whole glance. Uh, when most sighted people look at a page, they'll kind of notice, yeah, I can see the header and the footer and maybe the navigation off to one side and a content area somewhere. But of course, you can't do that sort of holistic assessment of a page as a screen reader user. What you can do, though, is use the regions of a page. So uh, in JAWS, if I hit the R key, we'll start to explore the page in regional chunks like this. Navigation region. So it tells me there's a navigation region on the page, and if I hit that key again. Search this site clickable, search region. I've got a, a search region on the page. Main region. A main region, which uh, tells me all things being called, that's the main uh, content area of the page. Heading level two, link reading list, banner. Uh, and then I come to uh, a banner area, so something that's using the- Alert, Laura Katz has left the meet. And Posted in content information. Uh, some content information, so uh, that's the, uh, the footer there. And we can keep going through the page uh, like this to find the different sort of chunks. And all this is picked up uh, probably by the use of the HTML5 sectioning elements, header, footer, nav, main, or it could possibly be because Bruce is using uh, the ARIA role equivalent, uh, role equals banner, role equals content info for footer, role equals main, role equals navigation. It's the element, is it? Good. So that's by far the best way to do it. It's a uh, nice, simple, accessible HTML. Uh, but in doing so, in that one shortcut, I can move from big chunk of the page to the next. And it starts to give me a sense of the whole the whole page, as in the, the key blocks that make it up. Bruce Lawson. So if I go. Incredibly useful. Doesn't cost you anything to write. Doesn't get in the way for people who don't use any kind of assistive technologies. But really useful for somebody who does need it. Also, uh, 
Put your hand up if your boss has ever said, please make this site rank lower on Google. <laughs> OK. This doesn't just help people with a disability. People like me have been boring audiences across the world with talks like this saying, if you use HTML properly, you get better search results. Last month, two months ago, Google actually published numbers and information. Mr. Google says, when you add markup to your content, you help search engines understand the different components of a page. When Google systems understand your page more clearly, Google search can surface content through the cool features discussed in the post, which can enhance the user experience and get you more traffic. Eventbrite saw a 100% increase in year-on-year -year growth of traffic from search. Job Rapido saw 115% in organic traffic, 270% increase of new registrations. Uh, Rakuten saw a 2.7 times increase in traffic from search engines and a 1.5% increase in session duration. What magic made this happen? This. This is from my personal blog because in 2008, I was trying to learn about HTML5, so I just, uh, computer science term, fucked about with my WordPress templates to try and actually make them use HTML5. So each article on my blog has an HTML5 article element. Ah, uh -huh, it's that one. I have an HTML5 article element. Then I have some HTML5 microdata, item type, from schema.org blog post. Schema.org is a consortium of Google, Microsoft, who have Bing, uh, Yandex, which is the biggest search engine in Russia, and Baidu, which is the biggest search engine in China. And they have a vocabulary for almost every kind of content you can think about. You want recipes, you want football scores, you want pop music, you want medical supplies, you want blog posts, there's a vocabulary for it. And then, stop it, then I say, this H2, its property is that it's a headline. That comes from blog posting uh, vocabulary. And this time element, because you can have a time element in HTML5, it's the date created, it's also the publication date, and it's the date published. Simple as that. And that gives you demonstrable benefits in the search engines. So even if you hate blind people, hands up if you hate disabled people, Cool, because I have a disability, but I'm also halfway to a black belt in karate, so you hate me, we can go into the car park. Um, yeah, you can get demonstrable benefits. Also, in the latest edition of Safari Reader on uh, Apple Watch, um, when they released this last year, September-ish, they said, OK, so this is how we decide how we show the content on this tiny little real estate. We will prioritize things wrapped in an article element. And we know how to display certain content if you have an item prop of title, an item prop of author, subheading, pub date, etc. This just comes free if you use the correct semantic. Uh, for figure, image, fig caption, we will display these in a special standard way from your markup. And if you use input type equals tell, you get a telephone keypad. If you use input type equals date, you get this. If you don't use those, it's extra clicks for the user. And it's a pain in the ass clicking on your watch. All of this comes for free if you use those HTML5 uh, markup. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Bruce, OK. You have a fashion blog. I do. It's what's Bruce wearing today. Yeah. For any of you who need some inspiration um, to look good. But I know what you're thinking. Hey, Bruce, you have a fashion blog, but you are not glamorous or beautiful. So how did they allow you to buy an Apple Watch? And how did you get early access to the beta in order to test your markup? I didn't. I had no idea when I wrote that markup eight years ago that there would ever be an Apple Watch. I couldn't even have dreamed that you would have the web on a watch when I wrote that markup in, oh, it's 2008, so it's 11 years ago. But because I 
use semantic markup, I had future-proofed my site. So now, with no extra work from me, when a new device comes along, it just works, because I was using HTML5 properly, rather than just loads of divs. In order to convince you further, accessibility enhances usability. Um, some researchers from the University of Switzerland, which is kind of near Germany, I'm told. Um, anybody from Switzerland here? OK. So <clears throat> they did tests with people who do not have a disability. And they gave them accessible websites and discovered that 61 participants without disabilities used one in three websites differing in levels of accessibility. A high level of web accessibility led to better performance, task completion time and task completion rate, than low <coughs> or very low accessibility. For sites made with disabled people in mind worked better for people who do not have disabilities. High web accessibility improved user ratings perceived usability, aesthetics, workload, and trustworthiness compared to low or very low accessibility. Yeah, the University of Psychology in Switzerland near Germany. Cool. There's the PDF. Uh, if anybody wants this information, I will tweet a link to the slides um, after I've had some sardines and some seafood and a bottle or two of port. Um, this is my friend Jamie Knight. <clears throat> He's senior research engineer at the BBC. He's autistic. Quite often, he loses the power of speech. Uh, but he said something I think is really profound. No one comes to our sites disabled. They come with impairments. We disable them. Just remember, where the fluffy bunny rabbit of good HTML goes, the tweety bird of accessibility just follows along. If you take nothing else from this talk, remember this picture. Isn't it lovely? They were delicious, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so Uncle Timbo said, the web is for everyone, and collectively we hold the power. I'm, I'm not stopping. Look at your watch. I'm not stopping till I've finished. The web is for everyone, <clears throat> and collectively we hold the power to change it. It won't be easy, but if we dream a little and work a lot, we can get the web we want. So what can you do? You, the nice people. Learn the semantics of HTML. There are 120-ish elements, that's all, and many of them are old and deprecated, and you'll never use them. 120 is not a lot. <clears throat> Most two-year-olds can say 100 words. By the time your toddler is two and a half, she will probably know close to 300 words. All I'm asking is that your HTML vocabulary be larger than his. Isn't it a lovely picture? He was delicious, by the way. Um, <laughs> you can run automated tests and go for low-hanging fruit, e.g. color contrast. Here's me, invited to lovely Lisbon to talk to you nice people, an expert in HTML. And I recently tested my website, and I found out that I didn't have enough contrast in visited links in my navigation. Uh, WebAIM did a survey of the top million home pages. 98% of them have accessibility errors. The most common one is simply low contrast. Then you have missing alternate text. This is trivial to deal with. Empty links. Why would you have an empty link? Missing form labels. You saw the advantage of form labels. Missing document language. That's as simple as putting HTML lang equals PT or lang equals EN. And that tells a screen reader what language you're using. Trivial to implement. So I used this really excellent contrast widget, which is a bookmarklet made by a friend of mine called Ada. Uh, and it goes through and it highlights areas where the contrast is wrong. I go into DevTools, try a different color, rerun the bookmarklet. When it tells me I'm good to go, tweak my CSS, and there we are. 
You can also use HTML and CSS wherever possible. Don't use JavaScript if you can do it in HTML and CSS. Make sites that work in JavaScript and then enhance with JavaScript. Choose your libraries carefully. If you're using React, Tenon has a library of components. They've tested each one with people with disabilities. Each one is guaranteed to be accessible, and it's free and open source. Thoroughly recommend it. Or you could use React Bootstrap. In their navigation component, they have div class equals nav. They could have had nav class equals nav, but they chose not to. So I would not use this. Don't do this. Here's your website. Let me just add some JavaScript. Mmm, yum, perfect. We cannot continue to bloat our website with JavaScript. The median mobile website at the end of last year had 384K of JavaScript. This might be React that you're sending down the wire, which is huge. Then, you're, then the phone has to parse it. Then it has to process it. Then it has to make a DOM. This takes time. It you, hogs the network. And it's forcing the user's battery to run the CPU, making the run out of battery. My friend Alex Russell, who's a sinister mastermind at Google, said, we cannot expect cannot continue to use as much JavaScript as we now do and expect the web to flourish. We need to confront the developer experience bait and switch. Tools that cost the poorest users to pay wealthy developers a bunk. If you're using React because it's easier for you and has no advantage to a developer, uh, to the user, you are making your users pay for you to be lazy. And it is real money. In Germany, if you want to buy an entry-level mobile broadband package of 500 megabytes a month, in Germany, you must work for one hour at average national wage. In the USA, if you want 500 megabytes a month of mobile broadband, you must work for six hours. In Nigeria, you must work for 28 hours. And in Brazil, you must work for 34 hours. So if you are vomiting down massive images that you haven't compressed, if you are vomiting down hundreds of kilobytes of React to make your life easier, you are making these people's lives harder. And that, my friends in Lisbon, is kind of rude. In Nigeria, the data needed to watch two minutes of online video a day can cost more than sending a child to school for a month. Yes, I know that that hero video, the auto plays on your home page, is gorgeous. But it's not more gorgeous than a child's education, I guarantee you. Your React application will never load faster than 1.1 seconds on the average phone in India. I'm not stopping. Your Angular app will always take at least 2.7 seconds to boot up. In the world, there's 1.1 billion people like us with fast internet, always on, super good devices. There are 3.2 billion people in the world who use the internet. There's 5.2 billion mobile phones on the planet. There's 7 billion people within mobile phone range. The next users are going to come on mobile, of course. By the year 2100, which is going to be a bit late for me, but you're all young and groovy, so you'll be alive. In the year 2100, the world population will stabilize at 11 billion people. And half of the, world's half of the people in the world will live in one of these 10 countries. Only one of them is in the developed world. By 2100, the population of Asia will increase from 4 billion to 5 billion. The population of Africa will increase from 1 billion to 5 billion. 
These are from the UN, United Nations, by the way. The population of the West will decline. The only growing demographic is seniors in Latin America. Developing countries, and I don't like that term, but whatevs. Developing countries are home to 94% of the global offline population. And the World Bank said in 2016, making the internet universally accessible and affordable should be a global priority. But it's still pretty much unaffordable to many people, largely because we are sending massive amounts of JavaScript down the wire. But these people are your next customers. Just from the demographics, these people are your next customers. The more JavaScript you send them, the more auto-playing videos you send them, the less they're going to look at your site and the more they're going to go to your competitor's site. And also, don't forget that for many, many people, the internet is not just a way to look at funny videos on YouTube or to stalk your high school ex on Facebook. You know who you are. Um, <clears throat> for many people, for tens of millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa, if you want medical care, you have miles or kilometers to walk. But if you have a feature phone or the slow internet connection, you can access this, where there is no doctor, uh, a healthcare guide written for people in villages who are not trained, translated into hundreds of local languages. And this is first-line medical care. It is proven that in villages where they have one mobile phone and a solar-powered charger, the, uh, the death rate of mothers in childbirth goes down because they can access this. There are tens of millions of people for whom school textbooks are an unaffordable luxury. But with a feature phone and internet access and worldreader.org, there are hundreds of thousands of school textbooks translated into many, many different languages for free. There are tens of millions of people in horrible regimes across the world where having the wrong political opinion or the wrong religion or being in love with the wrong gender can get you locked up or worse. But they have a lifeline to the outside world for the web. As an Egyptian internet activist said, if you want to liberate a country, give them the internet. Uh, that's a lot of hippie bullshit, I know, because I'm wearing a hippie shirt. So here's some numbers. McKinsey. Uh, a management consultancy group said, an increase in internet maturity similar to the one experienced in mature countries over the past five years creates an increase in real gross domestic product per capita, per person, of 500 US dollars. To put that into perspective, it took the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century 50 years to produce the same result. So you are the new... Thomas Edison's, you are the new Tesla's, you are the new Isambard Kingdom Brunel's, you are the people driving this hyper-fast industrial revolution. You can choose whether to clog up the wire with massive auto-playing videos, gigantic JavaScript libraries that lock these people out, or you can choose to use HTML right, correctly, make it sleek, make it performant, and give the websites that you produce to your next customers. To be, yeah, this is on my fashion blog. I'll give you the URL in a bit. Um, to be a web superhero, you don't need to do much. Just learn the 120 elements of HTML. Only use JavaScript if you can't accomplish it using foundational web technologies. Compress your images. Test in other browsers, not just Chrome. Test in an old Nokia, not your super fast iPhone. Because the web is not computers. The web is not clouds. The web is these women in an African village. The web is this blind guy in Toronto. The web are these women on a bus I met in Bangladesh. The web is this woman I met on the streets in Taipei and this farmer and his granddaughter I stayed with in Cambodia, and this guy on the metro 
in New York. As Sir Uncle Timbo said, it's for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. No. Uh, we will take one question, if there is one. One question right there. Uh, Alexander. Uh, hello. Uh, Bruce, your yesterday talk was encouraging, and uh, today's talk makes me sad. So I want to make a question, not for you, but for the audience, and it will be here a bit uh, from several parts. How many of you have used uh, mobile internet at the time of WAP? <laughs> How many of you have uh, used uh, text browsers? Have you ever tried to look at uh, your own website with uh, JavaScript and CSS disabled? <laughs> That's it. Thank you, everybody. And if you look at Bruce L on the Twitters before the end of the day, I'll post a link to the slides with all the uh, information and citations so you can you know, bore your husbands and wives, uh, <laughs> shout at people on the metro, get drunk and tell everybody in the bar while sobbing into your pint of port. And uh, those of you who are from Lisbon, it's been my first time in Lisbon, my first time in Portugal. What a marvelous city and country. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you very much, Ruth. <laughs> Up next, whoa. Up next, we'll be having a talk on React. Okay, <laughs> stay around. <laughs>